One of the beneficial things about preaching through uh, the Bible verse by verse and preaching through a chapter expositorily is to be able to see <coughs> connections of thought that are made. Connections from one chapter to the other. Connections like I pointed out to you already from chapter 11 of Romans uh, into chapter uh, 12. We see this greatly in our passage concerning the idea of mercy. And so take your Bibles and turn, please, to Romans chapter 11 and 12 one more time. I know that you thought that I messed that up, that I'm going senile in my old age of 40, but I did not mess that up. I want to show it to you one more time as we read again through the text. Would you stand, please, again with me? Romans chapter 11 beginning in verse number 30, For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy, this is talking about Jews and Gentiles, if you've been here for the preaching, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy again for for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon them all. Look up here. Four times the mercy of God is talked about. Four wonderful times to remnant Jews, to Gentiles who when Jesus came turned and believed on him, to those Jews who nationally one day will all turn to him at the second coming and believe on him. It all is because of God's wonderful mercy. A bunch of praise goes on between the verses down to chapter 12. And I wish I could preach that 10 more times. Verse 33, oh, the depth and, and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, as it exalts his name for several verses. And then it comes to very practical things in chapter 12, and it says this. Thinking still of the mercies of God, I beseech you, I appeal to you, I beg you, that is. I beg you, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, talking to believers, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You may be seated. We need to understand before we go into the exact phrases and verses of verse number 1 through 2, we must understand the appeal being made here. We must understand the grounds of appeal, the reason, the motivation that the author is begging us to present our bodies to God. It is not a whip that is cracking. It's not a list of rules that is compelling. It's not an ugly preacher that's telling you, you better do this or God's going to chasten you. It is an appeal to understand how merciful God has been to you. It is an appeal for you to understand that if you stand today saved and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, it just didn't happen randomly. That God had great mercy by the mercies of God, verse number one. He appeals us or he begs us. I must confess that I never understood the importance of the phrase in verse number one until we preached out of chapter 11. I never made the connection. I never realized that it connected back up to the verses. Yet four times in chapter 11, right before Chapter 12, he tells us mercy, 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 mercy. A great mercy to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Describing God's perfect way and timing in mercy to save people who are perishing. Now think about that incredible mercy towards you as an individual. This morning I appeal to you in the passage from that mercy of God that had mercy upon you. Think about God's incredible mercy toward individuals that will be saved by his mercy because he chose to slay his son, Jesus Christ. It's what we're all singing about. It's what we come to church. This is where, where we all hang our hats, this thing, Jesus Christ crucified. Tell me one great thing I know, Jesus Christ crucified. It's all about Christ. It's all about what happened there on the cross. It's all about the love of mercy. This mercy on wicked sinners like you and I. Like you and me is the reason in verse number 33 through 36 of chapter 11 that he breaks out. Look there. Look, please look at there. And I'm not, I'm serious. I would love to re-preach this again. I didn't do justice to it last week. But verse number 33 through verse number 36 breaks out in great praise because, because Almighty God had mercy on us, had mercy on the world. 
When Adam and Eve sinned and blew it in the garden, he didn't just squeeze the ball of the earth and destroy it. He had mercy. Wonderful mercy. Sweetest word, mercy on us. This mercy on wicked sinners is the praise of the end of chapter 11. It concludes that the rescue of sinners determined to sin, they're straight, determined to sin, heading straight for the gates of hell with all of their might, you and I. All of their rescue is, notice the last phrase in verse number 36, all of him, all through him, and all glory to him. He deserves all the glory for the rescue. It's all of his mercy. He is the reason. His mercy is the reason that if you were to die today, you would not split hell wide open. It is only of his mercy that he saved you. And then verse number one comes. And on the appeal of mercy, he begs us, the writer, by inspiration, by the mercies of God, I beg you, I beseech you, I appeal to you to present your body to God the rest of your days. That's a pretty strong argument. It's a, pretty, it's a pretty small thing that the one who saved me from an eternity of the lake of fire appeals to me on the grounds of the mercy that he showed me to give my life back to him. Is that not reasonable service? But then I'm preaching ahead of myself. Folks, God had incredible mercy on you. And I beg you that you do something about that mercy. I beg you that you respond in a certain way in this passage by the mercy of God that saved you in your sin and unbelief that you give your, the rest of your days, your life, your body, all of you to him. God had incredible mercy on you. You were floating out of control. Get the word picture. You were floating out of control in the river of sin, headed straight for the rapids of the lake of fire. You were not, ran you were not floating. You were swimming towards the rapids. In joy of sin, you actively were swimming towards destruction. You were headed towards the great plunge. And yet God, the day that he saved you, reached down with an incredible safety net and dipped you. The net of his grace dipped you out of destruction. Plucked you out, however you want to say it. Because of, his, of this mercy towards you, God begs you to do something about it. Now in verse number 1 and 2, because of him plucking you out of the waterfall that you were swimming towards with all of your might, he begs you to present, to surrender, to set aside, to yield your body the rest of your days, notice verse number 1, as a living sacrifice. Consecrate yourself only to God and the things that he loves. You say, what do you mean the things he loves? Well, read on. Present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. Those things that are acceptable to God is what I must consecrate myself to. I must dedicate myself. I must set myself aside. I must present myself as an offering to God that the rest of my days, because of his mercy, will be spent in doing things that, that he loves, that are for him. Now, if you understand that, it is a very serious and a meaningful consecration. It's not something that, that you do lip service to. It is a very serious dedication of yourself. But keep in mind that the reason that he's asking you to do it is not compulsion of anger. It's not compulsion of warning you. It's not compulsion, if you don't do this, I'm going to splat you. He's saying, I beg you because of my mercy I've shown to you. Folks, let me ask you a question. Do you realize where you should be? Do you realize where you would be without Jesus Christ? Do you realize where you would, would be after death had not Jesus Christ saved your soul? Do you realize where your family probably would be without the principles of Christ? Do you realize where you would be in spirit and in great sin and wickedness had it not be, been for the grace of God that plucked you out? Do we realize this? He wants you to Present your body unto God. You did not deserve salvation. You say, well, I kind of understand that. Let me smack you in the head with it from Romans 3. Turn, hold your place here and turn to Romans 3. I think that we have an awful time understanding what we really deserve. I think we say it and we do lip service to it, but I think that we do not really understand 
how, how the mercy of God came to us, I think we think we're pretty good. I think we actually think pretty good of ourselves. And we think we're, you know, that, you know, it's great that I got saved, you know, and whatever. And we even give ourselves credit towards it. Do you not understand what I mean by swimming towards the rapids of the lake of fire? That you willfully were trying to get away from God and not to him the day that you got saved. Do you not understand that he, by cords of grace, drew you to salvation? That it was not your idea. Look at Romans 3, what you really are. Verse number 9. What then? Are we better than they? Are we better than Jews? No, in no ways, for we have proved before we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. Put your name there. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Look up here. Verse 11 is clear. You were not seeking God. He was the shepherd come seeking after you, the lost. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With the tongues they have used deceit. And the poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And, and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. You say, Pastor, who in the world are these terrible people? It's me. It's you. It's what we really are. If some kind of spiritual scalpel could cut us open and see our hearts that are desperately wicked, who can know? We want to think good thoughts about ourselves. This is what we really were before God saved us. This is what everyone is without Jesus Christ. You say, well, I just don't really see myself as that bad. God does. And God is truth. He wrote here what you are. And so when, when he's begging, as you turn over to Romans 12, he's beseeching you, he's begging you and appealing to you to do something, Christian, on the basis of the mercy of him plucking you out of, of, of the hell that he deserved to pour on your head. Understand the power of the request. Understand the argument of what he is saying to you. I, I, I argue with you, I appeal to you, I beg you to present your body as a sacrifice to me, an offering to me, because of the incredible mercy I show to you, that I did not give you what you deserve. And so I ask you to give me your life, every day, all of it, everything in it, full consecration and dedication to me. These are powerful things here. He wants you to present your body to God in the, in the verse 1. To present is to hand your life to God. It is a definite decision and act of the will. It is not something that you just one day will do. It's something you decide to do. It's something you decide to do this morning. I will present my body as a living sacrifice to God. It can be translated yield, the word present, or to stand something off to the side, to set it apart. This is something that is unnatural. It's something that we don't want to do. It's something as Christians that we don't want to do. We want to live for ourselves. We have the constant battle of the new man in our flesh. Our flesh wants us to live for ourselves. He's saying, I'm asking you, based on the mercy I've shown to you, to give me, to present to me your, your entire life. Everything in your life, relationships, action, actions, goals, desires, future, service, time. I want it all. After all, I killed my son for you. I murdered my son for you. I beat his back until you could see the bones for you. I shoved thorns through his head for you. I pierced his hands and his side for you. I turned away from my, my son, whom I loved, three days. I put him through hell for you. Will you, will you not give your life, all of it, to me the rest of your days? It says body. Present your bodies. Body, that certainly means external body uh, uh, actions, the things that we do. But the word body, soma, is the Greek word, and other places means the entire amount. It's not just talking about physical body here. It's talking about the entire amount of you, your whole being, your thoughts, your goals, your desires, your imagination, your spiritual life, as well as the physical things you do. I want you to offer that.